See, this is one of the, the beautiful things I like about being down south. You're so polite. I say, good afternoon, everybody. I say, good afternoon. They don't do that out west. They're like, whatever, get out of here. Thank you for coming out on a rainy day. Um, and welcome to the ninth annual ASU Poetry Festival. Let's give that some applause. Um, in the last few years, we've been doing an exceptional job of bringing some of the most influential and important, powerful voices to Albany. Um, this year is no exception. We have as the major headliner, Ms. Natasha Trethaway. She'll be coming up and sharing with us tonight. Introducing her will be um, Ms. Madeline Lassen. Tomorrow we have um, Ms. Sharon Strange. In addition to that, we have Jessica Care Moore tomorrow night performing here. She will be performing with Celie McInnes, who's sitting over there. And then Tuesday, we have David Mills, um, who's sitting over there. All right, so we have a crazy lineup for you. And so I would hope that you would take advantage of all of these opportunities that are here to meet these poets, workshop with them in some of the workshops that they'll, that they'll be doing. Everything is free, and we want you to enjoy yourselves tremendously, okay? All right, um, afterwards, it, all of my students who are here for extra credit, <laughs> um, yay, you gotta love it, you gotta love it, you gotta do the teacher thing. Um, make sure that you see me, please, ma'am, please, sirs, okay? I know we had our routine where we sign in and sign out, so make sure that you see me to sign in and both sign out, um, okay? All right, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marlon Pollard, and I'm here to deliver the occasion. According to Mikhail Bakhtin, each social group speaks its own social dialect, which expresses the shared values of the people and ultimately reflects its language. Speaking both to and from the position of the other, black writers must deal not only with the external manifestations of racism and sexism, but also with the results of those distortions, specifically how they are internalized within themselves and one another. What distinguishes their writing, then, is the privileging rather than repressing of the other in themselves. In short, black writers refuse to surrender their difference. Instead, they use it as they write from a multitude of positionalities as women, men, mothers, fathers, lovers, black, and the oppressed. They use these frameworks as a means of conducting creative dialogues. For black women, this dialogue is particularly complex in that they speak in multiple voices. The plurality of voices is what May Henderson calls speaking in tongues. For Henderson, as black women speak in diverse languages, they weave into their work competing and complementary discourses. That is, as black women speak and write, they consistently raise the problem of black women's relationship to power. In doing this, they disrupt conventional definitions of blackness and they inscribe their own definitions of black womanhood on their own psyche, which requires a revision of former definitions. This investigative focus has created a space of much black expressive culture and it is the launch pad for poetic traditions that invite the listener to dialogue with their own inner speech in hopes of disrupting imposed social views. Tonight, we gather to experience one artist whose chorus of voices speak to our quest to identify and promote our understanding, ourselves, and to establish our place in an ever-growing and complex American social landscape. Tonight, we pause and we listen to our vision quest. Speaker for the festival, Professor Natasha Trethewey. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Talita Burley and I stand to introduce our first guest poet. Our first guest poet began writing in her journal in the first grade. About that moment, she remarks, there's that need when you're very young to hold on to everything. Unfortunately, I have the span of a firecracker. So recording all of my day did not work. I began writing one line a day describing the most intense part of it, good or bad. These lines collected and patterns arose. I didn't realize these would become my first poems. What emerged from this beginning was a distinct and resonant voice full of life and hope. 
a poetic language that she describes as a descriptive series of words more powerful than a single lonely word, a language to create new possibilities. Madeline Lessin is a poet from New Orleans, Louisiana. In 2014, she earned the National Student Poet Award, the nation's highest honor for teen poets presenting original work. The award is sponsored by the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities and First Lady Michelle Obama, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers Program. Madeline served as the Southwest National Student Poet. A major portion of her responsibilities was to serve as a literary ambassador, promoting poetry ac across her region and across the country. Currently, she is a freshman at Princeton University, Albany State University. Please join me in welcoming to our ninth annual poetry festival, Ms. Madeline Lassin. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm just gonna set a timer on my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, I thought I would start by reading a poem that kind of uh, introduces myself to y'all. I'm sorry I'm not a hugger. My body was meant to give birth to a deer. A human child would surely result in a hemorrhage. And I know this because of the way I chew gum. Only half a piece, as if the size of my mouth is any indication of the breadth of my hips. I've got a delicate constitution. This means I have a gag reflex and an antebellum debutante's sense of direction. The snap of bones in a mouse trap. I could love a deer because they look like me, bones unaccustomed to civilization. I will run fast enough to escape this world. Did the white mother with the hoodwinked eggs feel different giving birth to the black child? Feel its limbs tearing through her and realize the world would never judge them as her own? Something's off. Remember the minivan I saw the other day, the one with the yellow bird carcass hemmed to its bumper? I can bend like that if you watch me because you're always looking for parts of my body scattered around this town, built like a shotgun, skin the color of a deer. I do not crystallize in my sleep, but I'd like to. So thank you for seeing me that way, butterfly you birthed. Exactly two letters and three emails have been addressed to me as dearest creature, Make me a dearest human, mother who said she would build a womb if only for me. But you swaddled me as an infant. So really, I'm over embraces. Because you see the fear I hold when my body is discovered as a body. Run faster. These arms will make a pinprick out of you. So these next two poems, I, so I'm in my freshman year of college and I actually just got off my fall break and so I went back home for the first time uh, since I started and I was going through all my stuff and I found a poem that I wrote uh, when I was in my sophomore year of high school and it was about the first time I left home over the summer. So I thought that I would read that because I, I think it's really similar to another poem that I wrote uh, this past month uh, about my kind of uh, thinking about my first year of college. So I thought that I'd read them back to back so you can see how much or how little I've changed. <laughs> so this is Zuhitsu, July 8th, 2013. I walked to the grocery store by myself today because my family left me in a city where I don't know anyone. A month ago, I turned 16 and had never seen a mountain in the cityscape, in the horizon, in real life until I arrived here. Someone mentioned something to me about abuse, 
She held a robin's egg when she was six, and her mother let a friend smash it in his hands when there was nothing else to talk about. Walking alone in this strange city, did you know it's illegal to throw things away in other people's garbage cans here? My father once went to Singapore. Police beat a woman in the street for littering. Why does lipstick always get on your teeth, but never the blood from a canker sore? On the phone with my mother last night, she asked how I liked the mountains. I told her I preferred the swamp, and she laughed as if I had said, nothing impresses me anymore. I punched my brother in the jaw once, and all he did was look at me. North used to mean the sky. If I looked hard enough, I could see Arkansas through the clouds. But now I'm in Colorado, and I stare at the ground as I carry groceries back to my empty apartment. I watch over no one. I used to love when my mother would bathe me, warm water and the hands that made me. At the pickup light, a truck swings towards the curb, and I recognize a face, close-eyed but familiar, a woman from class who now hangs her head out the window as her boyfriend drives, another familiar face who doesn't recognize or see me so that I'm scared and stop before I fall into the street because the truck seemed further away than it actually was. Mountains like the knees of cypress trees whose peaks curve like the tops of eggs and remind me I'm nowhere I know. So here's its counterpart two years later, I guess. So this is secondary education. And I'm from New Orleans, so there's some New Orleans references, but it's one and the same down here. We never know where to go as the cicadas sing for the suffocated, as the Waffle House beneath the interstate glows and screams and sizzles, caked with our learning bodies, our diet of torn denim and nights we call crazy, always in a good way. My grandfather opened women's legs for a living. They asked him to put love in their hearts. Each time it stared back at him, eyes black and wailing, on a floor, in a room, on a bed, in the womb, of a hospital that's since been washed away. But there's talk the building will house a high school one day. Cafeteria apples, warm and mealy, I stare at the ceiling in the body my parents intended, always captured in clothes other people have worn. My mother handed me my diploma as I walked across the stage, but now she's moved to a school that needs her hands to paint its walls and hinge its doors so they can open behind the abandoned Six Flags and every year more people will leave her. This is what she loves. A challenge, a young person. This mildewed dress I left in the trunk of her car. We find a fainting chair on Esplanade and agree we've always wanted one. There's nothing to do but leave it, and neither of us has ever fainted nor owned a home. So I tell you about slipping across the kitchen floor last week. The tiles swept beneath me and the dog barked for some stupid reason. After graduation, we sit across from each other and I tell you a story of the boy you hate. How in the days after the storm, I played hide and seek with him in a graveyard. How he shit himself tucked inside a mausoleum and cried silently because he just couldn't stand to lose the game. We laugh, and there's no reason to feel guilty. No lesson crashes to the floor. We haven't had our best days yet. 
we haven't learned what to do with ourselves. So I thought that for my next poem, I would read a poem about my grandfather, just because I've been thinking about him um, a lot this past year, because there was, growing up, there was a cardinal that always would uh, ram into the uh, side of my house, and, and specifically my window in my room uh, growing up. And recently, I went to college, and a cardinal, I live on, all the way on the fourth floor, and a cardinal every morning has been running into my, um, my glass uh, window. And so we always said back home that it was my grandfather's ghost, um, and I think that he's followed me all the way up to New Jersey, so my cardinal. A cardinal throws himself at my window every morning, beats into his reflection in the glass, the way my grandfather understood that we have the same eyes. Always a little blood when I turn to the day, red feathers, red light, red slamming of skull, this I wake to. Each minute, the second self grows weaker, the cardinals propelling, softer, he does not understand how he appears, enemy of reflection. This bird looks more like my grandfather than I do, bones echoing lightning in my sleep. Yet I always mistake this body for the skies shattering. So another weird thing about this year is that it was also the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And, um, and, and it was fitting because I actually, it was the anniversary, so that was August 29th, and then the next day I left for college. So um, I, it was really special for me to be in the city, and uh, so I thought that I would read um, a couple of Katrina poems. Maybe not in order, but, um, but they're here, so I'll read them. Evacuation. I evacuated to Texas, and a piece of gravel found my eye. My mother dug it out with an aluminum gum wrapper. A tongue is an apple that never knew the ground. The state of Louisiana said I was black, so I became black. I comb my hair in the shower. A brown recluse bit me with its woodwind body. I rub eucalyptus on my skin and think of Yo-Yo Ma cradling a spider to his face. Water pressure as fickle as cooking meat. My twin mashed yams in a bowl, and I thought of a boat full of bananas and slippery bodies, brown and yellow at dusk on the dock. A horsefly is a fly that only receives its wings after a mother pounds meat to leather. But this never happens, because I didn't realize pork is red meat until my twin ate a tenderloin and I could hear his thoughts. Madeleine, I'm tired and sorry I made you wait. I ran into a pole while talking to a friend. Now I have a sore patch of skin. And there are miracle berries that make you believe vinegar is cream soda. Please ingest them and then look at me. So these last two poems, if I can find them, here we go. Um, this last, this one is a Katrina poem, and then the other one that I'm gonna read is just a me, me poem. It's just, <laughs> that's all I can call it. 
So this first poem is an elegy I wrote um, from the point of view of Harry Connick Jr. to his mentor, James Booker, who was a famous uh, R&B pianist, uh, and he is phenomenal. So this is Elegy for James Booker. Call me in the middle of the night as I pubes, and ask to speak to my father, the district attorney. I'll record our conversation and play it when I'm alone in public places. Let me have an absence of teeth so when I open my mouth, a listener can hear our coast eroding. Catch my fingers beneath yours. A nutria unearths my home. Orange teeth cut from the skeleton of the old tree that invented satsumas. Bring me with you to Japan. My father will give you a job in his office, and I'll make you a suit brackish water cannot melt. Call it a piano, and use my hands if you need them. And this last poem is called Semele, and it's based off of a Greek myth, but I'll explain that in the poem. Semele. What is left of our myth about happy times, but the color of our cheeks after a day in the sun? Semele slept with a god who penetrated her into ash. An infant squirmed in the soot, its limbs ready to be ripped off. I look. The levee is really a goose bump hammered out. Low blood pressure means you were a child born with the cord around its neck who believes the moon does not exist. A magic act when I turned six, Gary Golem the God, he did not combust like a miracle. Dionysus whispered to his followers, break bread with my body. They did, and this is how celebration was created. I can acclimate to any temperature that leaves me warm to hot. Do not abandon me beneath the moon. A grape may be picked if the picker has a glass eye and an embrace that says, now turn to fire. A peacock's neck beats like a heart as I sit on a bench in the zoo. We stare at each other. We both understand the kinks of God. I sweat until I feel the emptiness of my womb. A raven on a branch above my head reminds me of a bird that is not a raven. I walk home. I could tear my son apart and not remember in the morning. Thank you. about Natasha Trethway. Library of Congress, Jane Billington wrote, her poems dig beneath the surface of history, personal or communal, from childhood or from a century ago, to explore the human struggles that we all face. She is the author of Thrall, Native Guard, for which she won the 2007 Pulitzer Prize, Baylock's Ophelia, which was named a notable book for 2003 by the American Library Association and Domestic Work. She is also the author of Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. A memoir is forthcoming in 2015. Her first collection of poetry, Domestic Work, was selected by Rita Dove as the winner of the inaugural Cave Conum 
Poetry Prize for the best first book by an African-American poet and won both the 2001 Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Book Prize and the 2001 Lillian Smith Award for Poetry. She is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, Bellagio Studi Center, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Bunting Fellowship Program of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. Her poems have appeared in such journals and anthologies as American Poetry Review, Kenyon Review, The Southern Review, New England Review, Gettysburg Review, and several volumes of Best American Poetry. At Emory University, she is Robert W. Woodruff, Professor of English and Creative Writing. Ms. Trathaway served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. In addition to being United States Poet Laureate, she is the State Poet Laureate of Mississippi from 2016 to, 2000, to from 2012 to 2016. Her second term as Poet Laureate, she initiated a signature project on the PBS NewsHour poetry series known as Where Poetry Lives. In this series, Trethaway travels with senior correspondent Jeffrey Brown to various cities across the United States in order to explore societal issues through a link of poetry, literature, and Trethaway's own personal experiences. So please join me in welcoming to this, our ninth annual Albany State Poetry Festival, U.S. Poet Laureate, Ms. Natasha Trethaway. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be here with you guys today, even on this crazy rainy day, and I appreciate that you're all here. Uh, lovely to get to read with you and hear you, Madeline. Um, I'm going to start with uh, some poems from my third collection, Native Guard. Um, when my parents got married nearly uh, 50 years ago, I guess it was 50 years ago now that they got married, uh, interracial marriage was still illegal in at least 20 states in the nation. And this isn't uh, ancient history, I have to remind you, because uh, a lot of states took a long time to finally remove those statutes from their state constitutions. As a matter of fact, in the state of Alabama, they only voted in the late 90s whether to remove the anti-miscegenation laws from the books. And though they did vote to get rid of them, 42% of the voting population wanted to keep those laws so that at least symbolically it could be said that parents like mine couldn't be married legally and people like me born legally in the state. So when I was born, for whatever reason, I'm sure it had something to do with the law and breaking it, whoever filled out my birth certificate wrote, race of mother colored, race of father Canadian. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, It's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. By the way, when my parents um, tried to first get married, uh, they went to a little courthouse in Kentucky. 
and that's where they were turned away from. Sound familiar? Like recent history? Well, recent history is also uh, a history that reminds us about uh, the necessity for voting rights. Um, you know, having gotten to serve uh, as Poet Laureate at this historical moment, which is very significant to me because we're at the 150th anniversary of the Civil War and the 50th anniversary of major advances in the Civil Rights Movement, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act of 65. And even now, we're at a point where people are trying to disenfranchise certain voters yet again. Um, back in the late 60s, uh, the church across the street from my grandmother's house was doing a voter registration drive to get disenfranchised African-American voters registered. And the church didn't have its own driveway, so my grandmother used to let them park the church bus in her driveway. Because of that, we never knew if the act of terrorism that happened was because of the voter registration drive at the church or because of the interracial family living with my grandmother, me and my parents. Incident. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shades drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross, trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our rooms and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had all dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. Southern Gothic. I have lain down into 1970 into the bed my parents will share for only a few more years. Early evening, they have not yet turned from each other in sleep, their bodies curved, parentheses framing the separate lives they'll wake to. Dreaming, I am again the child with too many questions, the endless why and why and why. My mother cannot answer, her mouth closed, a gesture toward her future, cold lips stitched shut. The lines in my young father's face deepen toward an expression of grief. I have come home from the schoolyard with the words that shadow us in this small southern town. Peckerwood and nigger lover, half-breed and zebra, words that take shape outside us. We're huddled on the tiny island of bed, quiet in the language of blood, the house unsteady on its cinder block haunches, sinking deeper into the muck of ancestry. Oil lamps flicker around us, our shadows, dark glyphs on the wall, bigger and stranger than we are. My mother dreams another country. Already the words are changing. She is changing from colored to Negro, black still years ahead. This is 1966. She is married to a white man, and there are more names for what grows inside her. It is enough to worry about words like mongrel and the infertility of mules and mulattoes while flipping through a book of baby names. She has come home to wait out the long months, her room unchanged since she's been gone, dolls winking down from every shelf, all of them white. Every day she is flanked by the rituals of superstition, and there is a name she will learn for this too, maternal impression, the shape like an unknown country marking the back of the newborn's thigh. 
For now, women tell her to clear her head, to steady her hands, or she'll gray a lock of the child's hair wherever she worries her own, imprint somewhere the outline of a thing she craves too much. They tell her to stanch her cravings by eating dirt. All spring she is sat on her hands, her fingers numb. For a while each day she can't feel anything she touches. The arbor out back, the landscape's green tangle, the mole hill of her own swelling. Here, outside the city limits, cars speed by, clouds of red dust in their wake. She breathes it in, Mississippi, then drifts toward sleep, thinking of some place she's never been. Late, Mississippi is a dark backdrop bearing down on the windows of her room. On the TV in the corner, the station signs off, broadcasting its nightly salutation, the waving stars and stripes, our national anthem. So I'm going to switch to my most recent collection, Thrall, now. Thrall is uh, very much about um, a book about knowledge. I, I appreciate the young man's introduction uh, th for the occasion, because indeed this is a book that tries to consider received knowledge, particularly uh, the, the knowledge of the Enlightenment period. My father and I used to discuss the Enlightenment all the time. He's a big Enlightenment fan, and how could one not be a fan of the Enlightenment? But then I began to read deeper into some ideas about race and difference that were first codified during the Enlightenment, hierarchies of race. And I've tried to trace them in many ways across time and space to what I think of now as a deeply ingrained and unexamined notions of racial difference often manifest in ideas of white supremacy and white supremacy's expected twin black inferiority. I wanted to see how we could find these things, how we could measure them across time and space in literature, in art, in law, but also in the intimate relationships in loving families, such as my relationship with my white father. The book has a couple of epigraphs that uh, together, I think, uh, speak to this conversation. My father was also a poet, and so, um, this is a very private conversation, really, that I'm having with my father in a very public way, in the only language that he would really listen to. The two epigraphs are from Robert Penn Warren and T.S. Eliot, and together they read, What is love? One name for it is knowledge. After such knowledge, what forgiveness? So I mentioned that my father uh, was also a poet, um, and this poem that I'm going to read has a line in it you'll hear that was from one of my father's poems. My father and I used to stand at podiums like this uh, a great deal together. We'd read back and forth because our poems spoke to each other. It took me 40 years to figure out what bothered me about the moment in this poem when he gets to this line that always made me feel like the Venus Hottentot on display. The poem is after a chalk drawing by J. H. Hasselhorst from 1864. Knowledge. Whoever she was, she comes to us like this. Lips parted, long hair spilling from the table like water from a pitcher. Nipples drawn out for inspection. Perhaps to foreshadow the object she'll become, a skeleton on a pedestal, a row of skulls on a shelf. To make a study of the ideal female body, four men gather around her. She is young and beautiful and drowned, a Venus de Medici risen from the sea, sleeping. As if we could mistake this work for sacrilege, the artist entombs her body in a pyramid of light, a temple of science over which the anatomist presides. In the service of beauty, to know it, he lifts a flap of skin beneath her breast as one might draw back a sheet. We will not see his step-by-step -step parsing, a translation, 
Mary or Catherine or Elizabeth, to Corpus, Ariela, Vulva, in his hands, instruments of the empirical, scalpel, pincers, cold as the room must be cold, all the men in coats, trimmed in velvet or fur, soft as the down of her pubis. Now one man is smoking, another tilts his head to get a better look. Yet another, at the head of the table, peers down as if enthralled, his fist on a stack of books. In the drawing, this is only the first cut, a delicate wounding, and yet how easily the anatomist blade opens a place in me like a curtain drawn upon a room in which each learned man is my father. And I hear again his words. I study my crossbreed child. Misnomer and taxonomy, the language of zoology. Here he is all of them, the preoccupied man, an artist, collector of experience, the skeptic angling his head, his thoughts tilting toward what I cannot know. The marshaller of knowledge, knuckling down a stack of books. Even the dissector, his scalpel in hand like a pen poised above me, aimed straight for my heart. So when I started writing this book, um, one of the things I was doing, I, I just finished Native Guard, and um, I always go back and look up all the words I think I know in the OED to remind myself of those secondary and tertiary and on and on definitions that can deepen the figurative levels of a poem. Um, and so I went to look up the word native because I'd used native in the title of my other book. And I was surprised at the definition that comes up first in the OED. I expected it to be something like, you know, if you're a native of Georgia or a plant that's native to a certain region. But the definition that came up was someone born into the condition of servitude, a thrall. And so we have in the word native already the idea of empire, of colonialism. When we go there to conquer those people, they are the natives and they are in thrall to us. And thus the title of the book, Thrall. The first place I looked when I was trying to find representations in art across the centuries uh, was the period of the Enlightenment, and I found the Costa paintings of colonial Mexico. And across the 18th century, the Costa paintings of colonial Mexico represented uh, the mixed blood unions that were taking place in the colony. They were done in series of 16. They began with the white Spaniard father and showed all the different blood mixtures that you could have, the different offspring created by those unions, and right there on the painting as well, the taxonomies created to name those mixed blood children. I was fascinated by these not only because of the idea uh, that at birth your name was recorded in the book of Costas if you were mixed race and there it stayed and you stayed, but also uh, they, the, they believed, and I think this has remained with us even now, the idea that over a few uh, generations of intermarriage, intermixing, Indian blood uh, can be purified to whiteness, but that the taint of African blood is irreversible. So you get names like mulatto returning backwards, hold yourself in midair, and I don't understand you. This is uh, after a series of Costa paintings by Juan Rodriguez Suarez, circa 1715. Taxonomy. One, de Espanol y de India produce mestizo. The canvas is a leaden sky behind them, heavy with words, gold letters inscribing an equation of blood. This plus this equals this as if a contract with nature or a museum label, ethnographic, precise. See how the father's hand beneath its crown of lace curls around his daughter's head. She's nearly fair as he is, Calidad, see it in the brooch at her collar, the lace framing her face. 
An infant, she is born over the servant's left shoulder, bound to him by a sling, the plain blue cloth knotted at his throat. If the father, his hand on her skull, divines, as the physiognomist does, the mysteries of her character, discursive, legible on her light flesh, in the soft curl of her hair, we cannot know it. So gentle the eye he turns toward her. The mother, glancing sideways toward him, the scarf on her head, white as his face, his powdered wig, gestures with one hand a shape like the letter C. C, she seems to say, what we have made. The servant, still a child, cranes his neck, turns his face up toward all of them. He is dark as history, origin of the word native the weight of blood, a pale mistress on his back, heavier every year. Two, De Espanol y Negra Produce Mulatto. Still, the centuries have not dulled the sullenness of the child's expression. If there is light inside him, it does not shine through the paint that holds his face in profile, his domed forehead, eyes nearly closed beneath a heavy brow. Though inside, the boy's father stands in his cloak and hat. It's as if he's just come in or that he's leaving. We see him transient, rolling a cigarette, myopic, his eyelids drawn against the child passing before him. At the stove, the boy's mother contorts, watchful, her neck twisting on its spine, red beads yoked at her throat like a necklace of blood, her face so black she nearly disappears into the canvas, the dark wall upon which we see the words that name them. What should we make of any of this? Remove the words above their heads, put something else in place of the child, a table, perhaps, upon which the man might set his hat, or a dog upon which to bestow the blessing of his touch. And the story changes. The boy is a palimpsest of paint, layers of color, history rendering him that precise shade of in-between. Before this, he was nothing, blank canvas, before image or word, before a last brushstroke fixed him in his place. Three, de Espanol y Mestiza produce Castiza. How not to see in this gesture the mind of the colony? In the mother's arms, the child hinged at her womb, dark cradle of mixed blood, call it Mexico, turns toward the father, reaching to him as if back to Spain, to the promise of blood alchemy, three easy steps to purity. From a Spaniard and an Indian, a mestizo. From a mestizo and a Spaniard, a castizo. From a castizo and a Spaniard, a Spaniard. We see her here, one generation away, nearly slipping her mother's careful grip. Four, the Book of Castas. Call it the Catalog of Mixed Bloods, or the Book of Not. Not Spaniard, not white, but mulatto returning backwards, or hold yourself in midair, and the Morisca, the Lobo, the Chino, Sambo, Albino, and the No Te Entiendo, the I Don't Understand You. Guidebook to the colony, record of each crossed birth, it is the typology of taint, of stain, blemish, sullying spot, that which can be purified, that which cannot, Canaan's black fate, how like a dirty joke it seems. What do you call that space between the dark geographies of sex? Call it the taint, as in taint one and it taint the other illicit and yet naming still what is between. Between her parents, the child, mulatto returning backwards, cannot slip their hold. The triptych their bodies make 
in paint, in blood, her name, written down in the book of Custas, all her kind, in thrall, to a word. I like to uh, call this poem my response to the help. It's after a photograph from the series The Americans by Robert Frank. Help, 1968. When I see Frank's photograph of a white infant in the dark arms of a woman who must be the maid, I think of my mother and the year we spent alone, my father at sea. The woman stands in profile back against a wall holding her charge, their faces side by side, the look on the child's face strangely prescient, a tiny furrow in the space between her brows. Neither of them looks toward the camera, nor do they look at each other. That year, when my mother took me for walks, she was mistaken again and again for my maid. Years later, she told me she'd say I was her daughter, and each time strangers would stare in disbelief, then empty the change from their pockets. Now I think of the betrayals of flesh, how she must have tried to make of her face an inscrutable mask and hold it there as they made their small offerings, pressing coins into my hands. How, like the woman in the photograph she must have seemed, carrying me each day white in her arms as if she were a prop, a black backdrop, the dark foil in this American story. So just a couple more. Um, I wanted to see how far back I could go. I said I started with the 18th century, um, the Enlightenment. And so I was wondering how else uh, in art might I find representations of ideas of race and difference. And uh, I was sitting in my office one day and I happened to notice that I, I had a book on a top shelf called The Panorama of the Renaissance. And I pulled it down and found in The Panorama of the Renaissance um, a section about race in the Renaissance and, an Ill and a painting that I'd never seen before. The painting uh, was one of the paintings about uh, the miracle, the myth of the miracle miraculous transplant by uh, Cosmas and Damien, who were the patron saints of medicine. The miracle goes back to about uh, the, the 12th, uh, or 12th or 13th century as an oral narrative uh, in Greek. Uh, later on, it becomes represented pictorially in altarpieces and carvings and paintings elsewhere in about the 14th century uh, on up into uh, the, the 17th century. Um, in all the paintings, uh, you see the, the brothers, Cosmas and Damien. They were told uh, that they needed to replace the leg of a white sacristan uh, who had gangrene or some other kind of uh, disease, and they had to remove the leg. They were told to go and get the leg, uh, a black leg. Um, in some of the representations, you see them performing the transplant as if uh, inspired with divine inspiration without any medical instruments. Later on, you see them, for example, in a graveyard with a hacksaw, uh, desecrating a grave to get a leg. And later on, you even see them taking the leg of a live donor. This is where it began for me. I wanted to know how it was that someone came to donate their leg for this. Miracle of the Black Leg. Always the dark body hewn asunder. Always one man is healed, his sick limb replaced, placed in the other man's grave. The white leg buried beside the corpse or attached as if it were always there. If not for the dark appendage, you might miss the story beneath this story. What remains each time the myth changes. How, in one version, the doctors harvest the leg from a man four days dead in his tomb at the church of a martyr. 
or in another desecrate a body fresh in the graveyard at St. Peter in chains. There was buried just today an Ethiopian. Even now, it stays with us. When we mean to uncover the truth, we dig, say, unearth. Emblematic in paint, a signifier of the body's lacuna, the black leg is at once a grafted narrative, a redacted line of text, and in this scene, a dark stocking pulled above the knee. Here, the patient is sleeping, his head at rest in his hand. Beatific, he looks as if he'll wake from a dream. On the floor, beside the bed, a dead moor. Hands crossed at the groin, the swapped limb white and rotting, fused in place. And in the corner, a question, poised as if to speak the syntax of sloughing, a snake's curved form. It emerges from the mouth of a boy like a tongue, slippery and rooted in the body as knowledge. For centuries, this is how the myth repeats. The miracle in words or wood or paint is a record of thought. See how the story changes. In one painting, the Ethiop is merely a body, featureless in a coffin, so black he has no face. In another, the patient at the top of the frame seems to writhe in pain, the black leg grafted to his thigh. Below him, a mirror of suffering, the blackamoor, his body a fragment, arched across the doctor's lap as if dying from his wound. If not imminence, the soul's bright anchor, blood passed from one to the other, what knowledge haunts each body, what history, what phantom ache. One man always low, in a grave or on the ground, the other up high, closer to heaven. One man always diseased, the other a body in service, plundered. Both men are alive in Bioldo's carving. In twinned relief, they hold the same posture, the same pained face, each man reaching to touch his left leg. The black man on the floor holds his stump. Above him, the doctor restrains the patient's arm as if to prevent him touching the dark amendment of flesh. How not to see it? The men bound one to the other, symbiotic, one man rendered expendable, the other worthy of this sacrifice. Inversion after version, even when the Ethiopian isn't there, the leg is a stand-in, a black modifier against the white body, a piece cut off, as in the origin of the word comma, sejura in a story that's still being written. I'm going to close with two poems now. It was um, perhaps Thomas Jefferson uh, in Notes on the State of Virginia who first called for another kind of parsing of the black body. He thought that if you could get anatomists to cut the Negro open and do a kind of comparative anatomy, you would be able to discover what he believed to be the root of black inferiority. There were doctors that did this kind of work in the 19th century. And this is a persona poem in the voice of Dr. Samuel Adolphus Cartwright on dissecting the white Negro, 1851. To strip from the flesh the specious skin, to weigh in the brain pan seeds of white pepper, to find in the body its own diminishment, blood deep and definite, to measure the heft of lack, 
to make of the work of faith the work of science, evidence the word of God, Canaan be the servant of servants, thus to know the truth of this, this derelict corpus, a dark compendium, this atavistic assemblage, flatter feet, bowed legs, a shorter neck, so deep the tincture, see it? We still know white from not. This is the last poem I wrote for the book, and it was the one I had to write in order to finish it. And in order to do that, I had to take my father um, back to Monticello, uh, Jefferson's home. He had taken me there the first time over 25 years ago, and a lot had changed at Monticello in that time. Um, it's now uh, the official position of the Jefferson Foundation that Thomas Jefferson fathered several of Sally Hemings' children. That was a taboo subject 25 years ago. You weren't supposed to ask about that. Now, uh, the docent will announce that immediately upon uh, the beginning of your tour. And because of it, the kinds of conversations that one overhears have changed. For example, my father and I heard some people um, talking about whether or not how much, uh, as if it mattered, how much white blood Sally Hemings had. Enlightenment. In the portrait of Jefferson that hangs at Monticello, he is rendered two-toned, his forehead white with illumination, a lit bulb, the rest of his face in shadow, darkened as if the artist meant to contrast his bright knowledge, its dark subtext. By 1805, when Jefferson sat for the portrait, he was already linked to an affair with his slave. Against a backdrop blue and ethereal, a wash of paint that seems to hold him in relief, Jefferson gazes out across the centuries, his lips fixed as if he's just uttered some final word. The first time I saw the painting, I listened as my father explained the contradictions, how Jefferson hated slavery, though out of necessity my father said, had to own slaves. That his moral philosophy meant he could not have fathered those children, would have been impossible, my father said. For years, we debated the distance between word and deed. I'd follow my father from book to book, gathering citations, listen as he named, like a field guide to Virginia, each flower and tree and bird, as if to prove a man's pursuit of knowledge is greater than his shortcomings, the limits of his vision. I did not know then the subtext of our story, that my father could imagine Jefferson's words made flesh in my flesh, the improvement of the blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites, or that my father could believe he'd made me better. When I think of this now, I see how the past holds us captive, its beautiful ruin etched on the mind's eye. My young father, a rough outline of the old man he's become, needing to show me the better measure of his heart, an equation writ large at Monticello. That was years ago. Now we take in how much has changed. Talk of Sally Hemings, someone asking, how white was she? Parsing the fractions as if to name what made her worthy of Jefferson's attentions, a near white quadroon mistress, not a plain black slave. Imagine stepping back into the past, our guide tells us then, and I can't resist whispering to my father, this is where we split up. I'll head around to the back. When he laughs, I know he's grateful I've made a joke of it, this history that links us, white father, black daughter, even as it renders us other to each other.
Thank you. Do you mind joining me in thanking our poets again for sharing these wonderful works with us? It is always amazing to me um, the privilege that we have um, asking these poets who so freely give their, their time and efforts to come down to Albany, Georgia to share their, their words with us. And it's always a moving moment for me. Um, in, in closing, we have a couple of announcements. Um, tomorrow is the official opening of the um, Poetry Festival. Um, yours truly. If you haven't heard any of my poems, you will, definitely don't want to miss that. They aren't as magical and musical as the ones we've heard tonight, but they're raunchy. <laughs> yes. I'm a gutter boy. They're racy. They're fast. The musical, I'll, I'll read the first poem that I ever took, my, my first poem that I wrote when I took creative writing in undergrad. I got a D minus minus on it. <laughs> I will share that first, all right? And then that started me on my journey. I'll read that one. And then we'll go from there on the journey to all the wonderful things that happen. All right, so that starts tomorrow morning at 9 here in the ballroom. At 10 o'clock, we have um, Professor Sharon Strange. Um, sitting here in the blue. She'll be reading um, some of her poems for us, beautiful words again. And then at 12 o'clock, we have a discussion group workshop with Professor um, Celia McGinnis. Um, that will be next door in the um, conference room. And then at 2 o'clock tomorrow, um, Jessica Caremore, who gets in tonight, um, she will be doing a uh, discussion sort of poetic empowerment using your words as a poet to affect social change. She'll be leading a discussion circle on that. It's not a lecture, all right? It's a discussion group. So you should definitely come with questions and comments, and I'll be here in the ballroom, okay? And then tomorrow night we have Sharon and, uh, not Sharon, we have Jessica and Celie will be doing a poetry reading here in the ballroom tonight, tomorrow night. Okay, and then we have a whole lot of stuff going on on Tuesday. David Mills will be starting us off on Tuesday. And then we also have a special tribute um, for Mr. Arthur Berry. Um, we'll be doing some ephrastic poems. Some of my friends have sent some poems to us and they wrote poems based on the artwork of the late Mr. Arthur Berry. Um, so we'll be sharing some of his artwork with the audience and then reading the poems that were done in honor of him. And then we'll hopefully we'll have Miss Berry here with us as well to share some words. Okay, so we have a wonderful set of things going on. You definitely don't want to miss these, okay? All right, so um, again, help me thank the poets tonight. <laughs> and as one more request, um, we also put out the Literary Journal, the Parian Journal. We put that out every, every year. Um, we are in our submission season, so if you are a poet, or an essayist, or a short story writer, or a dramatist, you may want to write something and submit it to the journal. We are accepting um, submissions at this time, okay? Thank you very much, you all, for coming out and being a wonderful and patient audience with all this nasty weather. I appreciate it very much. All right, have a good night. <laughs>